Our second keynote speaker is Jason Hanley, who is director of Smart Grid and Emerging Technology and Operations at Duke Energy. I am a utility engineer. My first job out of college was with an electric utility company. Believe it or not, they had electricity when I graduated from college. <laughs> One of the first things I learned in the industry uh, working for the company I did was that there are certain companies you look up to, and one of the companies that you definitely looked up to in that industry in, in that day was Duke Energy. And that's still true today, although the industry is quite a bit different than it was now, and we didn't worry about uh, cybersecurity or we didn't worry about too much. It was a much simpler world. Nevertheless, uh, Duke was a very, very well-respected uh, firm in the field, and they still are. So it's a pleasure to have Jason with us today, and please welcome him to the ARC Forum. Jason? Good morning. Um, I set myself a timer because generally I have a tendency to go long at these things, so I'm going to try not to do that today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the ARC for the opportunity to be able to come and speak to you a little bit about what Duke Energy is doing uh, and how we're trying to really build a smarter energy future uh, for our customers. Um, so, let me see. All right. Just won't take a lot of time here, but just a little bit about, I don't know how many folks are familiar with Duke, but we have operations, electrical operations in six states. Um, we have over 150 years of service. Um, we have about 7.5 million electrical customers or metered accounts, which equates to about 24 million uh, of population. Uh, we also have uh, picked up some uh, Piedmont natural gas recently, so we now have 1.6 million gas customers. Um, so we pride ourselves on trying to be innovative. We try to uh, pride ourselves on trying to be more sustainable. Uh, we've done very well from the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and we are one of the corporate uh, best citizens for the corporate 100. So let's just talk about where the industry is going and where Duke Energy is going. Um, so we are given a path at Duke by our senior management council. And that council has decided that the project that we're going to take forward is called the Road Ahead. And the Road Ahead really consists of about five parts. Uh, first is transforming the customer experience. That's vital for what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're going to modernize the electrical grid. And we're going to do that uh, by spending $25 billion over the next 10 years investing in grid modernization programs. Um, we're also very uh, focused on generating cleaner electricity. Uh, besides the fact that we're putting $11 billion over the next 10 years in cleaner uh, energy, we're shutting down coal plants as we, we continue forward. We're building a tremendous amount of renewables as we move forward. And then we're also expanding our gas infrastructure. With the acquisition of Piedmont a year or so ago, uh, what we see is there is uh, potential for revenue growth uh, from the gas infrastructure. And so we're moving from 8% today uh, to in 10 years being at 15% of our uh, total business. And probably one of the most important things that we're going to be doing over the next uh, 10 years is we're going to be improving and really modernizing our regulatory mechanisms for rate recovery. Um, the, re the mechanisms that we have today are generally somewhere between 50 to 100 years old in some cases. Uh, so there is significant need for modernization of these regulatory acts. So why are we doing this? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that the electrical industry has been changing, and it's been changing for a while. And it doesn't really matter um, what we think, it's what our customers think. And they are telling us in no uncertain terms that they want more choice and control. And it doesn't matter if we're in an unregulated market or in a, in a regulated market, they still want choice and control over how they use and how they view their energy usage. We're also being severely affected by distributed energy resources, wind, solar, very good renewable sources that are coming online, but we have to understand that these have an impact to the way our system operates, and we have to have a better plan in order to integrate them properly into our system. And so we are focused on driving more grid intelligence out to the edge of our grid. And of course, uh, this group is very familiar with the Internet of Things, and just exactly how many things are going to be connected to our grid. 
uh, and how many things are we're going to be able to uh, be able to control, some of us, and some we're not going to be able to control from because they're going to be customer owned. And we have to deal with the reality that our revenues are shrinking and we're going to have to figure out a way uh, to uh, enhance our revenue structure, continue to provide dividend growth for our, for our shareholders in the future. Um, the flat to declining load growth is, is not a big secret. Um, distributed energy resources, um, energy efficiency appliances um, are all making it harder and harder uh, and they are, they're improving the customer's usage pattern to where they don't have to use as much. What that means for us is less kilowatt hour sales. So what we have to do is we have to figure out a new way to do business. We have to figure out a way to be able to continue to make money and provide great service for our customers. And of course, we kind of talk about cybersecurity. We have to talk about advanced analytics. Um, those are two cornerstones of where we're going to be going with our digital grid in the future and two cornerstones that we're going to have to have uh, a good plan for uh, for implementation as we go forward. So this slide really talks about our customers and how our thinking has evolved over the years with our customers. We no longer call our customers ratepayers. You will not hear that term at Duke Energy anymore. They are, they are customers. Uh, and we do not like the term ratepayers. And now we're looking at what our customers' wants and desires are going to be. And then how do we move to providing them customer-centric initiatives that they'll be able to act on? So some of those customer desires are they want to be empowered. We talked about choice and control a minute ago. Well, that choice and control comes with the ability to set their own tone and their own pace for the interactions. They may be happy with a one-time a month either email or bill from Duke Energy, but they may want a lot more interaction. They may want to be, be more of an active participant in their, uh, in their energy profile. And so we've got to be able to provide customers these types of initiatives. We're doing flexible due dates. So if a customer needs to move a due date for them, we'll be able to do that. A prepay program. So if you are able to uh, maybe lower uh, income, lower to middle income, or maybe you just want to prepay your electric bill, we're going to allow you to do that. And we're also going to be able, from a mobility standpoint, be able to send you multiple different types of alerts. Again, you have to sign up for these alerts. You have to be the one to say, yes, I want to be a part of this. We also understand that customers' wants and desires. Part of that is our customer base is changing. So, uh, yes, we have a tremendous amount of baby boomers st still, especially here in Florida. Um, but we have a lot of millennials coming in, and we have to understand that their usage profiles are completely different than what our, some of our existing customer base may be. They want to, number one, know where their power is coming from. They want to know that it's green and sustainable. And they don't really want um, a lot of fluff around it. They want to say things that can make themselves feel cool. And so we want to be able to create meaningful relationships and interactions with our customers. And we're doing that by a couple of things. One is uh, really going through our digital engagement process. How can we get better at social media? Because I would say that it's probably been a gap for us over the past few years and one we're trying to close extremely fast. That's the way our customers, especially our younger customers, want to engage with us anymore. They don't want to have to go uh, call us on the phone. They want us to be able to pick up their phone and, and look at an app or either, better than yet, just pr be provided a text alert uh, when something they need to know happens. They also want us involved in local communities and activities. They want to see our presence. They want to know that we're there for the long run. And of course, uh, we also work on sending out different weather alerts and different payment alerts for our customers to where they can understand when things are happening like a, uh, a week-long cold snap that they need to pay, maybe be prepared for uh, a higher bill and what can we help them with from either a flexible due date or splitting up payments. And then it's the last one on customer wants and desires is don't take me for granted. Yes. I, and most of my territories are regulated. Yes, I have a monopoly most places, but don't take me for granted. Go ahead and figure out ways to be able to indiv individualize the customer experience. And we're doing that through recognition with key milestones for, with our customers and also being able to figure out individual offers that, from uh, what's going to call the next best, best action uh, for our customers. So, Managing all of our customer touch points across these channels as an integrated system enables Duke Energy to create capacity and dedicate staff to customers where they, they really are looking for their value. So it doesn't matter if we're you know, online with a self-service portal 
uh, where you're looking at doing uh, on your digital phone, or whether you want to call us directly from a, a customer call center, or whether you're dealing with our local line presence. We want to ensure that the same experience is had over that, and it's a good experience to where we're going to be building stronger customer relationships at each level across this channel. And it, whether, whether each interaction means that you are physically reaching out to us or whether we're reaching out to you, your enhancement, uh, your thought about Duke Energy Enhance each time you, talk, you deal with us. So there's been a lot of talk about utility transformation, and we are, we're, not, we're not immune to that at all. Uh, that transformation for us is real. If you look at this slide, it really kind of shows exactly what we're, we're, we're dealing with. On the left-hand side of the slide, we have been making all of our earnings through our assets uh, and energy usage. And we've been making those across the entire energy value chain. But now what we're having to figure out is we're having to come and figure out more of how do we make earnings off of services and outcomes. And we'll speak more about outcomes in a second. Um, but we're also trying to increase at the same time our utility shareholder value, the, the value proposition to make people want to invest in Duke Energy. We do that by continuously being very good at what we do with budget monitoring, uh, our operation and maintenance, our um, excellence in um, reliability. But we also are trying to move into more of a products and services based model because as utility sales decline from a kilowatt hour sales perspective, you have to find other ways to uh, implement uh, that, that, uh, those business models and do products and services. So the triangle at the bottom really represents um, our journey. And we base our, everything we've done in the past off of our assets. We own a tremendous amount of assets. Unlike the new modern digital companies um, that, you know, like Airbnb, Uber, we, we, that, who don't own the assets, we do. And we're not getting out of that business. Uh, the, the asset business for us is one that is, works well and it's a good model for us. But what we're having to do is we're having to augment that business with networks and systems, smarter systems, more intelligence uh, leading out to the field. And then using the data that we get from all the sensorization of the equipment out in the field to really perform more advanced analytics. And all of this is helping us get to the point to where we're able to provide the correct outcome for our customer. And that's a different term that we've started using. It's no longer, what is the next product or service I can sell you, is what is your outcome that you want? It's more of a conversation that we have to have with the customer to find out really what do they want as the outcome and not just say, okay, this is what we think you need. Um, so we're work, really working hard on changing our strategy and really m moving towards more of the outcome-based model. Doing that through engaging customers in our communities. Um, so we, we do have smart devices that we can offer our customers. We do have the ability for, to help them understand their energy usage profiles better. Uh, we've moved over to a mobility platform to where they can take the information off the Duke Energy app and build in any type of uh, their smart home devices that they would like to. We can provide them added um, information, added data, added analytics. Uh, we send them basically um, mid-month how you're doing on your bill. So wh where are we projecting you for your bill at the end of the month? So no surprises. And then we also are moving into engagement around smart communities. Smart communities, um, smart cities if you will, um, is a tremendous opportunity to partner uh, and really prove our value uh, to the community with being able to offer enhanced experiences, uh, not only from a city perspective, but from an individual perspective. Um, one product here that we, are, we have just launched is you may see um, these digital banners or these digital billboards. Um, they can now go on streetlight poles and we offer those uh, for the ability from campus security, for blue lights or from uh, ad agencies. Um, even for emergency management, uh, so for, you know, if there's an emergency or there's news that needs to get out. So just a lot of different ways that we're starting to interact with the community to be able to offer them new products and services to help them decide what kind of outcome they want with Duke. And these are, I, next two slides are eye charts, I apologize for that, so I'm going to probably roll through them relatively quickly. So through transferring, uh, transforming the customer experience, we have to do a lot of things. We have to increase our mobile presence, which we are doing right now. Um, the personalized experience. In the past, we have always, as a utility, been told, you cannot differentiate your customers. You have to treat everyone the same. And while from a regulatory standpoint, yes, you have to treat everyone the same, 
from a personal interaction standpoint, you can't. You have to understand that there are differences in what each customer wants out of you. And so we're going through all these different programs for uh, being able to, when we do talk to customers, provide them different types of advice, different types of programs they want. A lot of our customers now are starting to move towards EVs. They're lots starting to move towards solar on their homes. How do we talk differently to these customers? How do we help them with that process? Can we provide them um, form, um, reputable companies that can help them through this process if that's what they're wanting? Um, we also are working extremely hard around smart meters. Um, so smart meters are nothing new. They've been around for a while. We're a little bit uh, later coming to the game. We had rolled out a, uh, a, a, a what's called an AMR meter, not an AMI meter. AMR stands for automatic meter reading. AMI is automatic meter infrastructure. So the AMI meters are what we're rolling out now uh, to our customers. They're enabling us to get a lot more data out of the system than we have in the past. And part of that is with the modernizing the, the power grid. So modernizing the power grid uh, it really has to do, first and foremost, with one of the things that we talked about was our assets. We have a tremendous amount of assets. We have to be able to reliably maintain those and, from an operational efficiency standpoint, be able to get the most out of those assets and depreciate them over the time. But we are moving into more smart grid uh, things, like we talked about electric vehicles. We're doing a lot more storm analytics. So we're figuring out when the next storm may come through how much it's going to impact us. How many crews do we need to carry over? They might have to go on overtime. So we're trying to minimize the cost by doing analytics to figure that out at the front end instead of just keeping everybody. We're doing calculations for hurricanes. Um, and the previous one we had here for Irma uh, in, in North Carolina, it worked extremely well. Uh, the forecasting um, in Florida, it worked well. Uh, also, but we're just now getting to these um, different types of models for hurricane forecasting uh, and, and outages that are helping us drive where we're going to stage crews, how many crews we need, and how long we think storms are going to last. We talked about distributed energy resources. Really, uh, that goes from uh, like re re renewable energy resources like wind and solar to just standard distributed generation. We've got to be able to integrate these systems back into our uh, grid as it goes. We're doing more, we talked about a little bit with uh, storm, but it's, it's really more around weather because as more distributed energy resources, especially solar and wind come in, we've got to understand their impact. They're variable sources of generation. They are not like my base load generators. I cannot count on them 100% of the time. So I've got to understand from a weather perspective how much I can get out of those devices at a certain time. So we're doing a lot of work around accurately measuring measurement of weather. And then the last things are we're really working for, on, on organizing our field workforce as well as creating an enterprise system health tool. And that tool at the end of the day will be a platform that we use to really do all of our operations and maintenance. Okay. Well, kind of talking, taking a step back, let's talk about the energy evolution. Um, so at this point, I think it'd be a good time just to take a minute and kind of walk through this chart. Um, so the left-hand left hand side of this chart is basically takes us all the way back to the 1890s and the early 1920s. That's when the power first started to be produced by our first power plants. And then as you continue to move left to right, what you're going to find is in the 1950s, you're going to start to see a lot of hydro start to pop up and a lot of nuclear start to pop up. And then in the later 70s and 80s, we got a lot more efficient with our plants. Uh, our plants became, um, you know, some more nuclear, but we figured out ways to burn cleaner coal. Uh, and also, and now in the 2000s, we're integrating renewable energy. If there's one thing I want you to notice as we move from right to left, for, excuse me, from left to right, it's the fact that this is an extremely linear line. Everything's happening in, per, in succession. But as you continue to move to the right, you see what I call the hairball of complexity. And it is really what we're starting to deal with now uh, as an electrical industry. Um, because we're not only integrating the electrical side, we're having to integrate the telecommunications side. And so from rooftop solar to EVs to what is this new digital platform that we're supposed to be using? And who, where is it going to come from? Who's going to make it? And you know, how do we integrate microgrids? How do we deal with this internet of things? We have been used to traditional one-way power flow. I make it, I generate it, I transmit it, you receive it. Now that model is completely upside down. Two-way power flow, multi-way power flow is something that is here, it's here today, and we're having to try and deal with it. 
And we embrace it, by the way. I don't want to sound like I don't. I think it's a great thing, and we're going to continue to embrace it as we move forward. We're putting in a tremendous amount of solar ourselves. And I'm sorry, I keep the, the front row here is probably getting lasered every now and then. I keep, keep trying to hit the, the move button, and I keep hitting the laser. So if anybody's blinded, I apologize. Um, so as we talked, today's grid really is kind of that traditional flow, left to right. It's power plants to homes. But as we continue to move forward, we're going to start integrating more of these renewable energy resources. But with that comes those issues. These variable sources don't integrate to our existing grid very easily. We have a grid that's difficult to maintain. Uh, a lot of the repairs have been manual. They're not automated. We're moving to a lot more automation. And the communications that we've been using are what I'm going to call relatively one-way communications, and we're having to move to much more two-way communications. So tomorrow's grid looks like a conglomeration of multiple generation sources from Duke and from others engaging in millions of energy transactions every second. And that's really what's going to be the peer-to-peer -peer energy economy of the future. And what this really does for us is it's going to generate data. It's going to generate a lot of data. A lot of the data I'm going to own, a lot of the data I'm not going to own. And a lot of it's going to be different forms than I'm ever used to seeing. And so what, one of the things that we've definitely um, a, uh, kind of resigned ourselves to is that we're going to have to make decisions in a different way. We've always made decisions centrally, but we're going to have to introduce a lot more distributed control in the future because the decisions that are going to have to be made on the second by second peer to peer energy transactions are going to be, need to be made in almost near real time. So with that, let's start talking about our grid and the investment plans that we have. So pretty simple. We're trying to build a grid for tomorrow that's going to be customer enabling. Uh, from our being able to offer choice and control, be a lot more flexible and reliable, uh, having the need for less human interaction, um, and also being able to anticipate failures. You're going to start to see us put out self-optimizing grids. You may have heard the term self-healing. Self-optimizing may be a new term because it's not only just when power goes out, we're going to switch and get you back on quicker. We're going to optimize when everything's good, when there's no outages. We're going to optimize to make sure that power flows, the watt and var flows across each protective device is optimal. And of course, it has to be sustainable. We have to ensure that what's happening with our local communities, we're enhancing our safe work environments, and, and we are actually providing a positive spot for our communities through the addition of jobs. Also, for building a smarter energy future, I think it's important to know what Duke Energy, what Duke Energy is holding. We maintain a grid of 95,000 square miles. Uh, we have 32,500 miles of transmission. We have 200. 38,000 miles of distribution lines. So this one little picture kind of condenses down a lot of what we're, what we're having to do. But building this future is really allowing us our, our current distribution system to meet to the, today's, to the needs of today. But we also know that we've got to upgrade that system to really go through and access um, uh, more reliable, more resiliency in the future. And one of the things that provides a challenge is the fact that the environment that we're in today means that technology is changing extremely rapidly. So our investment approach has to be the correct one because we have to be, it has to be flexible enough to allow us to make no regrets decisions today as well as plan for tomorrow for the technical changes that are going to be coming. So a little bit about what we're looking like. So you know, the first, one of the first slides said $25 billion over 10 years. Well, this is $10 billion in the first five, so we're getting ramped up. What does that look like for us? It looks like rolling out the rest of our AMI, the self-optimizing grid that we talk, talked about a minute ago, a lot of distributed uh, distribution hardening and resiliency. So we're going to do a tremendous amount of pole swap outs. We're going to do a lot of back lot to front lot. So a lot of times power lines run behind people's house. We're moving those to the front to where they can get them out of the backyards. We can underground a lot through targeted undergrounding. We're going to be doing a lot of transmission improvements. And then also looking at doing a lot of communication network upgrades. Uh, the communication for the smart grid is, of course, what makes it go. I can have all the assets in the world out there, but if I can't make them talk to each other, it does me no good. And these advanced systems, uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier about the platform. There is going to need, need to be a platform that's available that's going to allow us to be able to manage not only the existing data that comes from our SCADA systems as well as all these uh, resources that we're putting out in the field to make the grid more smart, but also be able to handle the prosumers of the world as they're coming on that want to buy and sell electricity to each other. 
our grid is going to be that, that highway that's going to allow them to be able to sell power back and forth to each other. So we've got to be able to have advanced systems to be able to do all that. And so the transition to the next generation grid is, is changing the way we make decisions. Um, there is going to be a cost to this, and we're working extremely hard to ensure that the, there's a fair distribution of the cost as we go forward. And while this, grid, this, this goal is extremely ambitious, uh, we plan to upgrade the grid in a reliable and safe way across all of our service territories, um, getting the most value out of it for our customers. So moving from the grid to kind of what drives part of that grid, and Kenny spoke about it earlier, which is the digital transformation. The digital transformation for us is really six pillars. Uh, and th those pillars involve product innovation for us, which is we've had to change the way we do our thinking. We've gone to a design thinking approach with Agile. Um, we're also seeing the, the a tremendous uptick in what we do around analytics. So, when I came to uh, Duke Energy 21 years ago, we hired utility engineers, power guys. Uh, we've hired more data scientists uh, in the past two years than I think we've hired, hired power guys. Uh, because the, the utility engineer of the future has to be able to do the analytics piece, the IT piece, the wireless communications piece, as well as the power piece. It's a multifaceted role. The data that's being produced is, extremely, is going to be extremely valuable for us if we utilize it in the right way. It's going to have a lot of, of value from the standpoint of, are we going to be able to manage the data and, and have it make sense to us on the back end? So these data dictionaries, the virtualization, but most importantly, that governance is going to be key for us as we go forward. We're embracing modern architectures. Um, believe it or not, we have clouds. Uh, we're scared to death of them in a lot of cases uh, from loss of personal information, but uh, we have and we look for new ways to utilize cloud information. Building that next generation user platform is going to be important from the mobility side uh, to actually how we do the web interfaces. And then as you know, this group is extremely familiar with automation uh, is going to be a key for us as we move forward. We don't know exactly how much automation we're going to be getting into yet, but we know that it's going to be key for us to move forward. So the roadmap for us uh, goes out for a while. And it's really going to be designed to move us uh, from our current business value chain from just focusing on our assets to really focusing more on that outcome base. And so we've already started. Uh, some things we've already completed. Uh, we've completed uh, some proactive communications. We've done doing storm analytics, uh, solar drone farm inspections. So if you want to come back today at 4, we'll talk a little bit more about drones and we'll talk about what's happening there. And then the, our out years, so this year and, and, and next year, we, you know, we're really working on a lot of outage usage, usage statistics, something called ISOP, for those of you not, it's Integrated System Operation Planning. So in, in the past, we've done all of our planning for generation out of our G side, our, our generation side. But what we're seeing is a lot of generation is now coming from our customers and coming from renewable side. So we're having to create this Integrated System Operations Planning tool that's going to allow us to be able to, to get a full view of what, what's going to be needed in the grid as we move forward. And then in the really out years, you're talking about chatbots. Uh, you're talking about um, outage uh, fault anticipation is something that we're working on extremely hard. So we, we know when we have outages now, but now we're going to start to look at signatures on lines uh, from being able to read waveforms and look and say, oh, that's a tree brushing up against the line. Before it causes an outage, I need to go send a tree crew out there and fix and cut that tree. So a lot of work has been going into the digital transformation side and the roadmap for our company. Now, something that's near and dear to my heart. This is where my group is. I, I lead a group uh, called at the Emerging Technology Office at Duke called um, Smart Grid um, Operations. Uh, and this is really what we focus on. We focus on what uh, is aptly named our bubble chart. So these are the new... Uh, technologies that we are looking at. Uh, so these are what's on our, our, our radar screen, if you will. So the x-axis is time to business impact, and that's business Duke business impact, and the y-axis is the technical maturity. Our goal is to move these technologies up and to the left, off the chart. So you're going to not see things like LED lighting, drones, uh, PV solar, um, EVs. All those have been transferred to our business already. These are the ones that are still what we consider in R&D phases and that we're working on. And our goal really is to be able to provide 
the strategy for Duke Energy to move forward? What are the newest technologies coming out that we're going to be able to have to use and, um, and get through uh, to be able to uh, figure out what is the next evolution for Duke? A lot of that revolves around intelligent machines. So we're doing a lot of different projects for intelligent machines now. Um, I'll just name out a couple. The, the picture right in the middle is, of course, AR, VR, where we're doing smart applications on, on um, smart glasses. Uh, first couple of uh, use cases that came out were for our supply chain from doing warehouse picking, warehouse sorting. So if you get a list of items that you need to pick, you now can just put on the glasses and they'll, the list will run through. You can sc barcode scan what you need and then it'll take you, direct you to the exact aisle, bin, and part number that you want. Uh, we're starting to do a little bit with uh, robotics and automation, really looking at it from a cognitive assistant point of view. So how can we use the robotics to be able to augment our learning. So potentially in the field one day there may be a robot in a substation. And when you walk into that substation, that robot is able to actually have a conversation with you and tell you everything that's going on. And say, these are what needs to be done. And if you have to repair something, oh guess what? They have that manual already embedded in them. They can take you step by step through it. The next piece is distributed intelligence. So um, again, what Kenny spoke about with open process automation I think is key for the, for, for the industry. And it lines up very well with one of the things that we're working on, which is distributed intelligence in another project called Open Field Message Bus. Open Field Message Bus is really more of an architecture for laying intelligence on the grid. We understand that we need multiple interactions now from a distributed nature. We need to be able to do things centrally, out at our substations, on our nodes at feeders, and then actually at the premise level also. And what um, distributed intelligence allows us to do is it allows us to pick the best place to make the decision. So local decisions need to be made locally. It enhances the overall operation, enhances the fact that you can get decisions made in more near real time. And we're moving DI from existing, which looks like the communications and control of today, which is more of a hub and spoke model, to more of, if you're familiar with Metcalfe's law, which states the value of a network is squared by the number of connected devices, to the future state of where we want to go where we're going to be having peer-to-peer -peer communication between grid edge devices. Why is this important to us? It's important to us because it's going to allow us to, uh, the ability to better integrate distributed energy resources as well as provide for potential microgrids for customers as they want to. We're going to be able to integrate both our assets and customer assets in a much better way. And then, you know, I almost didn't show up today because I came to the pre-workshop yesterday and you people scared me to death about cybersecurity. And I almost went home and started digging a bomb shelter and all the other stuff. Um, I toughed it out, <laughs> had a drink last night, decided I'd stay and just see what happens. So I'm not going to bore this group on cybersecurity. You know a lot more about it than I do. I will just tell you that we have a plan for how we're working through cybersecurity. Uh, identif identification is huge, trust is huge, health of the devices are huge, and actually virtualization of the devices. So of course we all understand security is much more than just cyber. You have to have physical assets, you have to have you know, storage. And one of the things we're trying to do is with, with the cyber is build in a much more resilient architecture than what we've had in the past. And the, I guess the biggest point that I'll, I'll kind of leave you with here is, is that we have decided that we are no longer going to be able to protect ourselves um, from threats. What we're going to do is we're going to work on identifying and isolating ourselves from those threats, threats as soon as we see them because you cannot predict, predict or protect yourself anymore like a traditional boundary because the boundary is everywhere now. And I want to thank you for today but I also want to just make sure uh, that you know that Duke Energy is, is here. We're trying to build this, uh, the, energy, the smart energy grid of the future and we think we're in a really good position to be able to do that. So with that I want to say thank you for the time.